Okay, welcome to lecture 2.3, Major Criminological Theories. Um, this is a tough micro lecture because uh, there are dozens of theories I could point to, all of which have some influence in the field. Also, um, it, it's difficult to encapsulate these in a small period of time, even if we focus on just a few. Let me recommend that you take our course on criminology to give you a stronger background. But if not, let's hit some of the highlights quickly. Um, First and foremost, most criminal justice theories about crime focus either externally or internally. So broadly speaking, they will look at why did an individual commit the crime, that's an internal focus, or what factors outside of him, society, poverty, whatever, really caused the crime to occur. And like I said, the lists are nearly endless as to what it is, is or is not a criminological theory. So we're just going to focus on a few quick ones. The big one, and this is one that's very important, um, and this developed quite early on and is very popular among Americans, um, is rational choice. So people commit crimes because they think about it, they weigh the options, they see that there's a greater benefit to committing the crime and a lower risk than in not. So, you know, one of the interesting statistics in America is about 10% of burglaries are solved. Well, if you're a burglar and you're trying to decide, hmm, should I commit a burglary? Am I likely to get caught? If the answer is, well, no, you're not likely to get caught. You've got a 90% probability of not being caught. Then you might say, well, it makes more sense for me to do it. Thus, crime control under the rational choice theory is really centered on the idea of deterrence, catching people, punishing people. Now, biological theories can focus a little bit externally, a little bit internally, so it's kind of a mix, but they certainly will focus on things like genetics or brain chemistry, and they can include man's um, genetics, like do you have a predisposition towards violence? You might say, well, this is crazy. But think about this. Your genetics is determined uh, early on as to whether you are male and female. Almost all crimes are committed by men. Therefore, genetics clearly plays at least some role in crime. Um, some of these, and here's one that was kind of dismissed, the avatar theory, the body physique, how you look uh, causes or is a manifestation of crime. Biochemical, biosocial, both of those are important uh, and a little bit more robust and developed and don't have really time to go too deeply into them. Labeling theory is a very popular one. And this is the idea that people become criminals because we call them criminals. If we start to describe someone uh, as a criminal or what they're doing is criminal behavior, they will live up to that label. And crime in this case becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. This has been also very closely linked to things like prejudice and stereotyping. It seems to have a, a fair amount of uh, scientific support. Psychological theories really run the gauntlet. The early psychological theories developed by people like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, um, not widely accepted anymore. The later ones, uh, ones that are a little bit more robust, uh, have really survived this sort of scientific development. Cognitive behavioral therapies, those, those demonstrate a lot more um, support scientifically. And it, they tend to focus on things like intelligence and personality. Social theories, and there's a lot of them here, uh, I really don't have time to look at if we're going to keep this lecture at a reasonable length. But basically, they, they include things like how is society constructed? How is, uh, is controls set up? How can people achieve success or suffer from failure? How can people learn to behave or not to behave? What's their environment like around them? Is it disorganized? Is it promoting disorganized or criminal behavior? Or is it prohibiting it. So you can look at social control. So social theories tend to look at larger society and see how it fosters or allows crime to exist. You know, one of the simplest quotes here, and I like this, and there's some dispute he said it, but it's one of my favorite quotes. It's, they asked Willie Sutton, a bank robber, why do you rob banks? And he said, I rob banks because that's where the money is. So why is there theft? Because there is money. Um, if you need money to survive and that's how you structure society, people will take it. If something is not valued, it's not even viewed as a theft. So 
there is, again, uh, certainly a grain of truth in a lot of these uh, social theories. I do ask you to think that today, as we are learning more about genetics, the mind, consciousness, some of these older theories have to be revised. They have to be discarded because science does not offer us eternal truth. You know, I, there was a debate between someone who, you know, a round earth and a flat earther. And they asked the, the scientist who was a round earther, what would it take for you to accept that the earth isn't round? And he said, well, you know, rigorous scientific evidence that it wasn't round, I would change my mind. And they asked the flat earther, what would change your mind? And he said, nothing. Uh, the earth is flat, period. Well, the difference between science and belief is encapsulated in that. If you will take evidence and evaluate it and change your opinion, you are engaging in science. If, however, you say, no, it's absolute truth, nothing changes, that's not science. That's faith. And while faith can have a role in life, it can't have much of a role in science.